Okay, so as you see, uh, we're going to talk tonight about from Cairo to Cambridge. I will explain to you, for those who don't know, what a Geniza is. Uh, so, um, basically, this is a synagogue in Cairo. It's called, right, the Ben Ezra Synagogue in Cairo. The Ben Ezra Synagogue, maybe I'll turn off the other light as well. So, this synagogue was built in 822 originally. If you can imagine, that's like, that's, right, it was rebuilt in 1025. Um, and this is, the, this is the building that was built in 1025. That means it's almost a thousand years old. Uh, the oldest synagogue out, uh, other than this, in, outside of Israel, is actually in Prague, which we'll be seeing in a couple of weeks. And that was built in 1300, approximately. That's the Alt Moishul, still in use today. There's still Minyanim going on there on Shabbos. Every Shabbos. And a reasonably good Kiddush too, so if you're ever there. Right? Uh, so the Ben Ezra synagogue in Cairo, though, is a thousand years old. Right? The oldest synagogue, of course, in Israel, but this is a thousand years old. Now, uh, you're probably aware, maybe you're not, but as you see here in these various sources, when a Torah scroll wears out, when Torah writing wears out, tefillin, mezuzah, or words of Torah, we don't throw them away. What we do is, we, uh, some people bury them. Right, however, the oldest custom was you had what's called a geniza. Geniza literally means to put away. It's a place where you, gonez means to put something away. So geniza was usually in the synagogue, and it was a place where you put all the old manuscripts. So if you had an old, there was an old ketuvah, the couple who had the ketuvah already passed away, it would go in there. If there's old, if someone was writing a book, the manuscript, the first manuscripts of his work of Torah, he wouldn't use those because you always chuck out the first, you know, first time you write it, right? And he'd go in there. Old Torahs, old Tanakhs, etc., etc. So this, in the back of the women's section, upstairs in the Ben Ezra Synagogue in Cairo, is accessible only by a ladder. Here, this is the ceiling, right? So that's a little hole there. And in that, wall, in that room there, there's basically a, a huge room. Just, they used to throw, they've been throwing what they consider, a lot of people consider just garbage, but they've been throwing stuff in there for a thousand years. Now, for most of that period of time, most people were not aware there was anything really precious there. I mean, you wouldn't think there's anything precious in here. Right? You go up there, what you see is rotting paper, some papyrus, some vellum, right? and it's all just like in a huge jumble. No one thought for years there was anything of value there, until... The mid-1800s. In the mid-1800s, there were two scholars, one at Oxford and one at Cambridge. The scholar at Oxford, they were both Jewish, but the one at Oxford, the one at Oxford, uh, name of Margulis, was an apostate. He's a Jew who had become a Christian. And as very often happens with an apostate of that sort, he was very anti-Jewish. And he also, he believed there was an ancient book called, in Latin, Ecclesiasticus, in Hebrew, we call it Ben Sirah. Not to be confused with Ecclesiastes, which is Kohelet, right? but rather Ecclesiasticus, which is Ben Sirah. It's a book of wisdom. It's not part of the Holy, it's not, it's not part of the Torah, Prophets and Writings. It's a book of ancient Jewish wisdom. Now, the scholar in Oxford believed that that book was originally written by Christians. And it was stolen by the rabbis. And the basis, who put it into Hebrew? Now, the basis of his belief Part of the debate was, and, and there were, the evidence for, him, for what he believed was the fact that the oldest manuscripts of Ben Sira were all in Greek and Latin. There was nothing in Hebrew, which was very old. The oldest, oldest copies of this were all in Greek and Latin, nothing in Hebrew. So, now, there was another fellow, also a Jew from Europe, whose original name was Shneer Zalman Schechter, who changed his name to Solomon Schechter, who was a, what's, what's called in Cambridge, a reader in Talmud and Hebrew. He was a professor in Talmud and Hebrew, not a religious Jew, but someone who believed in God, someone who was, who was deeply committed to Jewish study, etc. And he, Solomon Schefter, was in Cambridge. Now, here the story, and he, of course, vehemently opposed the view of the Jewish apostate in Oxford. So they've got this huge argument, the two of them. Now, what happens is, there's these two sisters, the Lewis, Mrs. Lewis was one of them, I've got the name of the other one, two Scottish sisters, who both of them were, lived in Cambridge, were good friends of Solomon Schechter, and they were Presbyterians, they were good friends of Schechter, but also they were amateur archaeologists. They could read fluently Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, 
Right? And many other ancient languages they could read. They were, they were responsible for discovering one of the oldest texts of the New Testament at the St. Ekaterina Monastery at, at Sinai, Mount Sinai. So they were very... These, these women were not your average Scottish widows. You know I mean? They're not like they're, they're sort of accumulating money in their mattress and eating cold porridge. Right? They were out... No offence to anyone Scottish here. But they were basically... <laughs> right? Actually, one of my close friends is Scottish. So, but, so anyway, but, but they were very into that. So anyway, they told Solomon Shefter, we're going to Cairo for... A, to, we're having a trip. Now, he knew that the Geniza existed in Cairo. No one thought there was much valuable there, and there were people who had occasionally found some things in that, you know, mid-19th century, there were people who found stuff. But the synagogue used to sell fragments as souvenirs. So you go to Cairo, you want a fragment, they'd sell it to you as a souvenir. So Solomon chapter says, listen, you go to Cairo, pick me up a souvenir. Now, they didn't have snow domes were not developed yet. Right, you have those things that you shake in snow, right, like the snow domes of the Cairo synagogue, right, well, Huh? Very typical for Egypt. Of course, right. Yes, snow domes, right. Egypt snow domes. <laughs> or bobblehead Maimonides, they didn't have a... Right, so action figures of the, of the authors of the mission. No, right. So basically, he says, pick me up a souvenir. The souvenir they picked up was some fragments from the Gnizza. So they paid money, they picked up fragments. From the... Now, these women were very astute. They looked at it, they said, this looks like a significant fragment. When they came back, they gave it to Solomon Shafter. Lo and behold, you know what the fragment was? The oldest Hebrew version of Ben Sira. Predating the Greek and the Latin by hundreds and hundreds of years. This is what we call in technical term for something like this is punkt. That's Yiddish. Right? Or it means exactly this is it happened. Divine providence. Right? The one fragment that they pick up as a souvenir for Solomon Shefter is the fragment that disproves the guy in Oxford. And there is no greater joy for someone at Cambridge to refuse someone at Oxford. And there's certainly no greater joy, it's like the Harvard Yale, right? And there's certainly no greater joy for someone who is a committed Jew and a Jewish scholar to refuse some apostate in Oxford, right, who's got this rubbish idea, right? So Schechter, they bring it to him and he discovers it. And this is a letter that Solomon Schechter wrote to, the, to Mrs. Lewis. He writes, I think we have reason to congratulate ourselves. The fragment I brought with me represents a piece of the original Hebrew of Ecclesiasticus. He, this is his own underlying. You can see how excited he was. You know, there's like drops of ink, there's things crossed out, underlined. He says, he says don't speak about this yet. Uh, don't speak about this matter yet until tomorrow. He says, he says, I will come to you tomorrow at 11 p.m. and talk over the matter with you, how to make the matter known. In haste and great excitement, yours sincerely, Solomon Schefter. So you can see the guy's trembling with excitement. Anyway, what happens is, he and a friend, he has a friend called Taylor, who was a Protestant professor at Cambridge, who was very, very wealthy. Schefter was as poor as a church mouse, if that would be an appropriate term, I'm not sure. Right? A shawl mouse, I don't think it's a In any case, right? Uh, so, 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 but Taylor, wealthy Protestant friend, close friend of, of Schechter, and the two of them go together to Cairo secretly. They don't tell anyone where they're going. They just flit off to Cairo, right? And they buy, they go up to the Gnizzet, they, they get everything they can get their hands on. There's stuff buried in the garden of the shawl, they dug that up, put it in boxes. There's something that they empty it out, they pay the shawl for this. Shawl was happy. He got rid of it. Yeah, they take the junk. You're right, they paid him, I don't know how much they paid. He comes back with three huge boxes with approximately close to 200,000 fragments. But this is, and Cambridge University gave him a room in which to study them with large windows. And there he is, right? Can you imagine? Look at these fragments. Can you imagine trying to discern 200,000 fragments? And you're trying to figure out, right? It was a, a miracle that he recognised that, that he recognised that first fragment was Ecclesiastes, was Ben Sirah. But he's basically he got sick out, uh, as a result of this. Obviously, breathing in all the dust from the manuscript, sitting in the room like this, right, at, at, at pouring over them. But again. Cambridge University supported him for this, and there were some Jewish private uh, investors who supported him. Taylor helped him. Eventually, um, Cambridge University Library moved the whole collection to the library, and they established what's called the Taylor Schechter Geniza Research Unit. Taylor Schechter Geniza Research Unit, which basically is a few rooms in the Cambridge Library. All the Geniza stuff, which is about 196,000 pieces, is kept in the basement together. I, we went down to the basement to see where stuff is stored. So we're walking with the libra with, 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 uh, librarian, Dr. Amir Ashur, and he's showing me, he's showing me, oh yes, this is all Newton's writings. Here's Darwin's, there's some stuff from Galileo. Oh, here's the Geniza stuff, is it? Right? And they bring it up to, the, to here to actually study it. 
Um, how did I get there? Basically, you can't just walk into the Gnizza and look around. You walk into the library, you've got to have security codes, you've got to, you're not going to, can't just walk in and walk. So there is a fellow in Lakewood by the name of a doctor, Mr. Eugene Zavaloff. Mr. Eugene Zavaloff is a collector of Jewish manuscripts and books. He has 20,000 books in his house. My son is a good friend of his grandson, and they were there. He has a sword from the time of the Exodus. He has, he has stuff from the Second Temple. He has 20,000 books. Amongst the books he has, he has 20 volumes of the first ever printed Talmud from 1520 in Venice. Do you know how much that is worth? So anyway, Mr. Zavaloff, because of his expertise and his collection, is a good friend, is a good friend with Dr. Ben Althwaite, who is the director of the Gnizza Research Unit. But it so happens that Mr. Eugene Zavaloff's son, Dr. Zavaloff, moved in to the house across from us, the street from us a couple of years ago. And our sons became instant friends. And they were over at our house for Shabbos. And I told him I'm going to England to lecture for a, for a couple of weeks. He says, oh, cool, why don't you go to the Gnizza? I said, how am I supposed to get into the Gnizza? He says, here. He says, email this guy. He tells me after Shabbos, I'll give you the email. Just mention my father's name, no problem. So I did, and they write back, when would you like to come? We'll organize someone. Wow. Right? So they organize the curator, the only Jew working there, whose name is Dr. Amir Ashur. Right? It's all non-Jews researching. There's one Jew from Tel Aviv University, Dr. Amir Ashur, who said he will spend as long as we want. So I went with a fr two friends of mine from London, uh, 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 Rabbi Aubrey Hirsch, who's a good friend of mine, who's a historian, and another friend of mine, Rabbi Akiva Tatz. So I told them, you guys want to go to the Gnizza? They said, are you kidding? But how do you get I said, yeah, let's go. We'll go. I have a guy there. He'll show us anything we want. So they're like freaking out. It's unbelievable. It's like, you know. So the three of us had this excursion. We had a little, little paper bag with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and everything. Anyway, actually, Marmite, because it was England. So anyway, this is the Gnizza. So now, first of all, uh, this is how the stuff looks when you first find it. That's like a, that's a papyrus. It's all squished together. There is a section of Tanakh. Now, the thing is, the problem is this. If you just take that out of the box and open it up, what's going to happen? It will fall apart. And or even if it doesn't fall apart, the ink will actually come off the page. So they actually have this painstaking restoration process. First of all, they take photographs of everything in a number of different ways. Infrared and ultraviolet, etc. And obviously, you can see that's the original. You can see, that, however, you do with ultraviolet, there's an entire... Uh, there's an entire section that you could not see otherwise. So they have people photographing it. They have people putting it, digitalizing the images. Uh, that is financed, by the way, by a Jew, religious Jew in Toronto called Mr. Fre uh, Fre uh, Freeberg, right, who actually is also uh, is a religious Jew. He's also very, very wealthy. He's got a doctorate in Jewish history, and he's a collector of manuscripts as well. So he is uh, Dov Freeberg. Um, and he is financing the effort to digitalize. But basically, they have people working painstakingly. And what they do, one of the things they do is they take micro dots of superglue and put them underneath each letter of ink to attach it to the document. Right? They inject it with this fire fine injector. They have these special stuff that they glue onto the back of the manuscripts. So it's painstaking work. But that's all, that's just restoring the actual physical artifact. Once you've restored the physical artifact, then the real work begins. Because just restoring the physical art of that means you've got a segment of 10 Hebrew words. What are you going to do with that? So therefore, what you have to do is figure out where this is from, who wrote it. So we have manuscripts from all over the world of handwriting comparisons of various rabbis, etc. And there are people who sit there pretty much all day and all night. That's all they do is this manuscript research. And it's kept in these the folders, right, uh, in actual plastic. It's not hermetically sealed because if there's no oxygen getting to it, it's going to rot. Right? So therefore, it's actually open to the air, and it's in these special, it's a special type of plastic, which, uh, I, I forgot, which has no acidity, and I've got the type of mylar or something like that. Anyway, um, so this is us. That's Dr. Amir Ashur. It's my friend Hirsch, and that's me. Right? Uh, basically, Dr. Amir Ashur has a doctorate in Talmud from Tel Aviv University, and he has spent his life researching this Cairo Gniza. And his expertise is, we'll get to it, prenuptial agreements in the Cairo Gniza. By far, one of the most common documents found in Cairo were prenups. Really? It's pretty shocking. We'll get to it. Prenuptial agreements. 400 of them. 400 of them. Right? It tells you something about the Jewish women in Cairo. Okay. <laughs> right? And maybe about the men. But okay, we'll get there. This is, this is actually the section I told you about. That's that piece that was originally found by the Scottish sisters, the Lu Mrs. Lewis, uh, which is the section of Ben Sira. Right, and it's also it's kept in. This is actually kept in glass, and it's uh, right there. That's the oldest fragment found. 
Now, this, now we'll have a look at some of the fragments. This is a section of Tanakh. Now, it's actually the oldest Tanakh. It's actually 942 CE. Tanakh means Torah, Prophets and Writings. All 24 books. This is actually the last page. And fortunately, we know who wrote it and when he wrote it. Because he's got this thing, a colophon at the end which is the person who writes the book will write at the end a colophon which writes who wrote it, where they lived, and what year. So he actually writes the year 942. I don't know if you can see it that well here, but you notice, you see the, the vowel sounds and the, and the singing notes? Do you know, see where they are? Just have a look at that. They're always on top. They're all on top, yes. They're on top. The vowels, in, in, when we write Hebrew, our vowels are in the middle, on the bottom, on the top, all over the place. Whereas the ancient Babylonian custom was, all the vowel sounds were actually on top of the words. So that's like one of the oldest fragments of Tanakh ever. And that is found, 942, that's found there. This is a letter from one of the Geonim. Now, you probably know that the era of the Talmud ended in about 500 CE, 1,500 years ago. Right? From about 500 until about 1040 was what's called the period of the Geonim. Gaon means either genius or exalted one. These were the great teachers of Torah who originally were the heads of the academies in Babylon and they spread throughout the Jewish world spreading Torah. One of the most famous of them was Rav Chushiel ben Elchanan. Rav Chushiel ben Elchanan, he lived in Cairo in Tunisia. And this is a letter by him to his relatives in Cairo. So for those who have studied this to understand that there's a, 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 just a social letter Right, by, Rav, by this Rav Chushiel Gaon, right, from Cairo and Tunisia, was found in the, in the Cairo Gniza. So it's written in Hebrew. I don't know if you can see. Can you, can you read that? Yeah. It says, Leha'eda, to the community. Hamavina, who is uh, understanding, Vetzedek, and righteous. Mevina, and understands, Ba'ale Ebuna, people of faith. Right, so he writes a very, very flowery and beautiful Hebrew. Uh, this is... One of the prenuptial agreements. I'm not, I, there are 400, so I'm not going to choose all of them. This particular prenup, the, the, pers- the husband's name, can you see that? Kibalti Ali Anai, Ali Ani, I have accepted upon myself a, a prenuptial agreement, for those who don't know, is before you get married, some people will sign an agreement in which the husband accepts upon himself huge financial penalties if he doesn't submit to certain conditions that, that are agreed upon. Okay, that's called a prenup. Like very, some people do it. Like if the husband does not provide his wife with a Jewish divorce so that she can get remarried, right? There are financial penalties that the courts will impose upon him for every day from from civil divorce until the get is granted. That's called a prenup, prenuptial agreement. Now in Cairo, this particular prenup, the guy's name is Tuvia, Ani Tuvia, right? And you know, his, the prenup is he agrees under great financial penalty, that he'll not hang out with unruly men. Anashim Puritsim. That means men who are, who are of poor character. So evidently this guy had a reputation. So his wife made him sign this before the wedding. He's not going to hang out with these Anashim Puritsim unruly men. Neither will he frequent places where they go, like billiard halls and stuff like that. Right? Nor will he invite them to the house. So those are the three conditions that he has to sign. The two most common conditions in the prenuptial agreements, one was if the husband raises his hand against his wife to hit her, then she will take the prenup to the court. The court will impose huge financial penalties on him and force him to divorce her. That was a very common thing. Obviously, in Egypt, we're talking about Egypt 11th century, 1,000 years ago, obviously uh, beating one's wife would have been totally normal. So, I mean, that was un- unfortunately a normal part of life. Right? However, in the Jewish community, in the Jewish community, the most common thing was that even though that was the, in the society around, in the Jewish community there were severe financial penalties imposed right, if, someone, if, if someone did that. And it's actually, uh, so, so this is in the prenuptial agreement. Right? Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Um, the, second most common, the second most common condition was the husband needed permission from his wife to leave Cairo. Any, any men here who signed anything like that? You, you imagine that? You sign, you have to get, every time you leave Cherry Hill, you have to have permission from your wife. I mean, it could be that happens anyway. You have to, honey, do you mind if I... Uh, not much to go to the supermarket and pick this up. With. What was the motivation for that? What was the motivation for that? Because some particular condition. I, I, believe, I believe, you see, a lot of men, a lot of the Jewish community in Cairo were merchants. And they went on long business trips. And those business trips were, A, dangerous. And a woman could end up 
uh, in a very bad situation, right? So and I got up. So therefore, it was it was dangerous to travel, right? And uh, and it was there were lengthy trips. So the the wife wanted to have a say in when her husband would do this. She says, you know what? We've got enough money. Forget it. Don't go. Right. So now this particular yeah. Was there always one way that the the, man, the woman was giving the man the. Uh, uh, yes, it, it, virtually all of them was like that. For some bizarre reason, it was always the, it was, yeah, yeah. I guess because it was a balance. Society as a whole was biased towards the man. Certainly in, in, the, certainly in the Islamic society of, of Egypt, uh, the, the things were heavily balanced, balanced towards the man. So this was an effort to, to correct the imbalance, I guess. So that's why virtually all of them are on the woman's side, not the man's side. Now, this particular prenup, there's something fascinating about the date. First of all, uh, you know, we write dates in our documents. Can you read that? Anyone read? The Rosh Chodesh Kislev, Shnat, Elef, Ushlosh Me'ot, V'chamishim, V'teisha, Shanim, Laminyan, Sha'anu Regilim, Limnotkan. It gives you the year, which is basically, I've got it, 1359. According to the, to the number we count here, the Fostat, Fostat was the name of Old Cairo, the area of Cairo where the Jews live is called Fostat. Fostat Mitzrayim, Egypt, Al Sha'al Nilus Hanahar on the Nile River. Generally, in Jewish documents, you, if, if there's a river nearby, you always identify the city, so and so city, by the river. In, in, in ancient times, they used to do that a lot of places. Frankfurt okay. on Main, right? Newcastle upon Tyne, right? And so on and so forth, right? So, so uh, Melbourne upon Yarra. Okay, no, we don't do that, so Melbourne, right? But anyway, so it says this. But I'll tell you what's problematic about the date. Look at the date, 1359. Now, this prenup, I told you, is when? 11th century. 1359 is a... If, if anyone looks at their marriage contract, anyone, any ladies looked at your marriage contract, the Ketuvah, what's it dated back to? The creation. Of the world. The creation. Yeah. It's creation. What's 1359? 39 is not, it's not to BCE, it's not CE, because Jews don't do that, and the date doesn't work out. It is not to creation. The answer is, it's back to the reign of Alexander of Macedon. Wow. You'll ask, what the heck? What's, what's that have to do with anything? The answer is, the Talmud says, Alexander of Macedon, when he invaded Israel, right, so he did not destroy the temple, and he allowed the Jews freedom of worship. So what did the Jews do to show our gratitude to Alexander? I think they're hey! We adopted Alexander as a Jewish name, so Jewish kids were called Alexander. B, the Talmud says we started to date our documents from the reign of Alexander. So here is a document, and if you calculate, I've done the calculation here, if 1359 is, is 1047 CE, which is actually exactly, Alexander's reign 3 is 312, so it's actually 1359 years from the reign of Alexander. So the Jews of Cairo are fulfilling this rabbinic law about dating the document from Alexander's reign. Clear? Sorry. This is a letter from 1048 describing an earthquake in Ramla, Israel. Wow. Ramla was a place in Israel. Now, Israel, as you know, has, has earthquakes, right? And there was a terrible earthquake in Ramla in that time. And he wrote, it was like a newsletter. He wrote to the Jewish community in Cairo describing what they were going through. He writes about people living in tents on the street, bodies strewn on the street, animals walking around, right, disease and plague, terrible, terrible descriptions that we are familiar with from very recent events. But it's amazing to see, and it's laced with verses from the Torah and the biblical references. It's, he, he, there's not one sentence which doesn't have some type of expression from the Bible. This is why, by the way, they put letters in the Gnizah. You wouldn't put our social letters in the Gniza. You wouldn't print out your emails and put it in the Gniza. It's just that we don't write this way. But ancient, in the ancient times, the Jews, when they'd write a letter, every second word would be... You'd use phrases from the Bible on a regular basis. In English, we do that, but we don't you do it much, right? Can a leopard change his spots? That's from Proverbs. Drop in the ocean, that's from Isaiah. Right? And, and two is better than one, that's from Proverbs. Right? And so there's many expressions that we use... Right, which actually from the Bible, we just don't realize it. But they deliberately would use expressions from the Bible. Consequently, when you found a letter, even though it's a description of an earthquake, it's the CNN report from 1048, right? <laughs> Nevertheless, it'll be put in the Gnizza. This is a ktuva, a marriage contract, right? Very much the same, almost exactly the same as modern day marriage contracts, right? Except there's fascinating here is there was a group of Jews called the Karaites. You heard of the Karaites? Karaites were Jews who rejected the oral tradition. And therefore, their festivals worked out on different dates than the rest of the Jews. 
they had different laws and customs, and they, Maimonides managed to argue them almost completely out of existence. Right? But this is before Maimonides. This is 11th century Cairo. So this is actually a ketuvah in which there's a marriage between a rabbinite Jew and a Karite woman. And part of the agreement is they'll respect each other, even though they have different dates of the festivals, they'll respect each other's dates of festivals. It's quite fascinating. Anyway, and it's signed by various rabbis, some of whom are rabbinites and some of whom are Karites. Okay. Yes. Can I ask a question about that? Yes. Um, the notion that even today, you know, a, a Sephardi woman marries a, a Ashkenazi fellow, so she's obligated to think on his minhagen. This apparently doesn't give any. That is uh, correct, because because the, the 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 fight between the two groups was so powerful. What's shocking is that there was a huge conflict between the traditional Jews and the Karaites, and yet he they married each other. And the answer may be that just that there, there was not a heck of a large group to choose from in terms of marriage. So if you found a woman who was a woman that you loved. Right, and, and, and you could get on with her. And religiously speaking, she was not exactly on the same page, but was willing to keep your stuff, you're willing to keep her stuff, then we're okay with it. I, uh, Shabbos must have been weird, because the Karaites believe that you're not allowed to have lights on in the house on Shabbos. They will, ha they will sit in the dark, only have cold food, and not have heating on. So the Karaites believe no fire, no light on Shabbos. In a Karite family, they blow out the candles before Shabbos. So, like, I guess she's sitting in a room in the dark, <laughs> eating cold tuna, and he's eating cholent with the lights on. <laughs> I, I, I can only imagine. Don't we need to go through conversion? Okay. No, no, not Carol. Nowadays they do, not then. Right, now, this is, right, nowadays, but not now. Now we're not allowed to marry Carol since the time of Maimonides. Now, Maimonides, who we're going to talk about in greater detail next week, Maimonides, of course, one of the greatest sages of the Jewish people ever lived, right, 12th century, in the 12, uh, 1100s to the 1200s. He lived, and he started off life in, in Spain, but he lived in Cairo for most of his life, in Fostat. He was the rabbi in Cairo, one of the great rabbis of Cairo. He was the physician of the court of the uh, of Salah al-Din, Saladin. And Maimonides wrote, he's a very prolific author, in the Cairo Gniza, Shock was amazing, was found numerous handwritten manuscripts of Maimonides' works written by Maimonides. Wow. So this is actually Maimonides' commentary on the Mishnah. And this is written by Maimonides, and you can see little diagrams he drew there. Now, the, the language here, you'll see it, it's hard to see, but it's Hebrew letters, but it's actually Arabic. Maimonides wrote most of his works in Arabic, what's called Judeo-Arabic, meaning it's Arabic words, but it's in Hebrew letters. Much like Yiddish, is a lot of German words, but it's written in Hebrew letters. So Judeo-Arabic was the language that most Jews used then. And so it was written in Arabic in Hebrew letters. Not everything. Here is a letter by Maimonides. You can see very clearly his signature. Can anyone see that? Moshe, Moses, Ben Rav, son of Rabbi Maimon, Zatzal of blessed memory. His father passed away by then. So that's his signature. Now, he, this is a letter, which is an interesting letter. He's recommending a certain Jewish, a certain scholar is traveling to another community. He asked Maimonides for a letter of recommendation that people don't know him there, right? They don't have the internet. They can't, you know, watch Shalom TV or anything like that. So what they do is, so he wants a letter of introduction to sell that Maimonides will attest that this guy's a scholar and that the community should, should exempt him from the usual tax. Scholars were exempted from the communal tax, right? And so this is the letter Maimonides writes to this scholar to go to this other community. I just enlarged his greeting at the end. It says, I don't know if you can see that, it says, Shloma Yerbe, may her peace be increased. U Shlom HaChaver, and the peace of, of the Chaver, the friend, that's another term for a scholar. Ubno and his son, Ushlom Beneich, and the peace of your son, right? Moshe ben Rav Maimon Zatzal, Maimonides, uh, handwriting. Of course, that part he wrote in Hebrew, the rest of it is in Arabic, which I don't know, but uh, there it is. It's Arabic written in Hebrew letters, okay? Uh, this, oh, that's, now, this is how the letters are kept, basically, as in this envelope, right? And that's Maimonides' letter, just sitting there in the envelope. Um, this is a section of Maimonides, what's called Mishneh Torah. That's his book of Jewish law. This, however, was written in Hebrew. Not Arabic, but Hebrew. So you can actually understand it. What's, what's amazing, if, you're a, if you've studied Maimonides, one of the coolest things about this is that you can see where he's crossed things out and rewritten stuff. So you can see the thought process of Maimonides. So, for example, here it says, Hilchot Nizikin, which means laws of damages. But he's crossed out Nizikin and he's written here, Nizkei Mamon, damages by property. I guess he felt 
that laws of damages was too broad a title for this section, because this section deals with property caused by your damage caused by your property. So, he re so uh, for anyone who actually who studied Maimonides, to actually see, and sometimes you can see he's rearranged the, the laws. Like he's put, he's, put, he's put it in a different order, because he was very, very, when he wrote his book, he was so careful about every single word. He was even careful about the order of the laws, and he was very careful even about the titles of the chapters. And you can see that by looking at his handwriting. Unfortunately, this was a long time ago, so the idiot stamped right in the middle there, Cambridge Library. <laughs> On the manuscript. Can you imagine that? Okay. All right. So there, there, for example, is, I don't know, is that in focus? Yes. It is focused, yeah. So there you can see, my, I've got written down here in, in regular Hebrew script, but there's Maimonides' writing of the first section, which is actually the same as we have in our editions of his Mishneh Torah. It's the same actual beginning of the laws of, of uh, property. Uh, this is a manuscript of his Guide for the Perplexed which is his, law, his book of philosophy, and it's actually written in Arabic, again, but Hebrew script. And here, you can tell sometimes, can you, anyone see? He quotes a verse here, so I can tell where it is, because the verse is only quoted once in Guide Perplex. It says, can anyone read that? Vayishkon kvod Hashem al har Sinai. The honor of God rests on Mount Sinai. Now, you notice the name God is written... Yud Yud, that's an abbreviation which we find in prayer books. It used to be believed that abbreviation was invented by the printers. But actually, right, Maimonides was writing how many years before printing? About 350 years before printing, he's already using this abbreviation. Why do we use this abbreviation for God's name, Yud Yud? Answer is very simple. Because you see, when we see God's name written down, it is written Yud, Hey, and Vav, and Hey. We don't pronounce that. We pronounce it how? Adonai, which is my master. So, but, so yud, God's name starts with a yud, yud hey and vav hey. The way we pronounce it ends with a yud. yud. So therefore we, so Hebrew abbreviation is the first letter and the last letter. So it's the first letter of the way it's written and the last letter of the way it's pronounced, they come together to make the abbreviation yud yud. This is, to me, was one of the coolest things that I saw. This is my modern squiggle. I asked him what I asked the expert, I asked the manuscript guy there, what is that? He says, simple, he says. Maimonides' pen was running out of ink, as you can see. He re-dipped it, did a squiggle, and then carried on with a stronger <laughs> <laughs> The reason I find that so beautiful is because Maimonides was a human being who achieved unbelievable greatness, incredible excellence, but he was a human being. No biographies. Like, there are many modern day biographies of great rabbis that will often, that will often, you know, at age three and a half they knew the Bible by heart, age six they knew Mishnah by heart, by age ten they'd outdone all their rabbis. Is that doing anyone a favour? No. Because it, it, what was great about our, about our great people was they were human beings, but they achieved unbelievable. Maimonides were, yeah, he had a pen that ran out of him. You know, he did a squiggle. Maimonides did squiggles as well. Maimonides did squiggles. I was recently a biography of a very great rabbi, I won't tell you who it is, a very great rabbi from the 1700s who writes in his diary about his struggles with some, with some crushes on various teenage girls when he was in his teenage years. Is a rabbi, if I tell you who the rabbi is, you haven't you heard of him, right? I'll tell you later, right? Uh, it's it's mind boggling, mind boggling. Story. Anyway, but, it's, but it shouldn't be, he's a human being. So here's my minority squiggle in the middle of Guy for Perplex. This is a mezuzah. It's the same mezuzah as ours, but there's one incredible, two differences. First of all, on the side of the mezuzah is written what? The names of angels. And here, you see down there? That's the oldest time a Magin David is ever used as a Jewish symbol. This is about approximately a time of the 12th century. There are no older examples of, of Magin Davids as Jewish symbols than the 12th century mezuzah. Until the, this was discovered, the oldest one was in Hungary, in a grave in Hungary from, I think, 13th century. In any case, right, now, the, uh, the reason I have this mezuzah here is because I've got here Maimonides. Maimonides writes, he says, people who write the names of angels on mezuzahs are fools and idiots. And have lost their... You know why, he says? Because they're taking a mitzvah of God and they're reducing it to a good luck charm. They figure, well, if the Shema is written on it and that's going to help me, hey, if I put in some other stuff, surely it'll be even better. He said, what idiots! He says it's a mitzvah of the Torah that God tells you, write the Shema on your doorpost. It's not a good luck charm and the more you write on it, the merrier. Right? If you get, take a computer program and you put an extra few dots, what's going to happen? Totally messed up! 
<laughs> Same thing here. So, that's, so again, the context in which Maimonides writes this is because people were doing that. There was a, there was a little there was superstition creeping in. Maimonides was a big fighter against any type of superstition and magic and stuff like that. Totally against it. Which is why the the, the guy there, Amir Ashur, who told me, listen, he says, you want to put your finger into that envelope and touch Maimonides' letter. You can do that. I said, I didn't want to do that. I said, Maimonides wouldn't approve. What, there's some magic touching his letter? It's a letter, right? There's, there's Torah in it. Learn the Torah. Touching the letter is meaningless. Maimonides, I'm sure, would not have been happy had I said, oh, wow, I touched the letter. Okay. Any case, <laughs> this is one of the most, this is a tearjerker, this one. This is actually a letter from Maimonides' brother, David. Maimonides' brother, David, they were very, very close. He describes his brother, David, as his friend, his student, his teacher, and his brother. In fact, when David died, Maimonides was in depression for a year. He could almost not, he describes how he could almost not get out of bed for a year after his brother died. Now, his brother died tragically. His brother was a merchant, and his brother supported, Maimonides was able to write all these books, most of them, because his brother David used to go and, and, and on, on uh, ships and was a merchant, he used to do a lot of trade. So his brother David, unfortunately, he was once on a ship on the way to India, and the ship sunk and he drowned. Maimonides now had to support both himself, but also his brother David's widow and his children, his orphans. So that's when Maimonides became a, a physician. He became a doctor. Right Now, this is the last letter his brother David wrote to Maimonides before he died. How do we know that? Because it describes a journey which his brother David drowned his ship. He was going from a port in Sudan. There's Cairo is up there. Right here is a port called Aydab in Sudan, and you get ships going through the Red Sea, and they go to India, which is around over there. Right, so his ship sunk around somewhere around here in the Red Sea. So he went across the desert to Aydab, and there from Aydab he wrote a letter back to Maimonides. That's the last letter he wrote to Maimonides, and then he then he drowned in that in that uh, in that uh, accident. Now this is a translation of the letter uh, to my beloved brother Rabbi. Now. You saw the state the letter was in, right? So as you can see, there's a lot of stuff missing. So this is a partial translation of what's, what we've got from the letter. But he writes, To my beloved brother Rabbi Moses, son of Reb Maimon, may the memory of the righteous be blessed. David, your brother who is longing for you, may God unite us under the most happy circumstances in his grace. He tells how troubled he is, and he walked around Adab. He traveled alone through the desert. He went through horrific experiences. The, the camel caravan that he was meant to go on no, it was attacked by bandits. He didn't go on it. He ended up going himself. Attacked by bandits. People died at first. He gets to Adab safely. He writes at the end, don't worry. He who saved us from the desert with its, and this missing, will save us at sea. Unfortunately, that did not happen. And he drowned at sea. And he writes, please calm the heart of the little one and her sister. Who's that? His children. That's a term of endearment for his wife and Maimonides' wife. Oh. They, were, they weren't sisters, but they were sisters-in-law. So he calls the little one and her sister Karma because, because he figured if she finds out what he went through in the desert, she'll get all anxious and panic ridden. And he says, the Talmud tells us you're not supposed to pray about things already passed. It's over. Carry on. So he says, don't even tell her about this. And uh, anyway, that's the last letter. And that, evidently Maimonides had it, put it into the Gnizah when he finished with it. And uh, we now have the letter that, that David wrote to Maimonides before he died. This is one of the most amazing things. This is a, there was a, a convert to Judaism by the name of Ovadia. Ovadia was a common name for converts to take. Anyone know why? Ovadia was a common name for converts. No. Nope. There's a simple reason. Ovadia was a prophet. Who, sorry? He was a minor prophet. He was a prophet. And he, was a, he wasn't a minor prophet. They're called the, the small books of the prophets, but not minor. Right? But in the English translation, they say that, but it's wrong. Anyway, but he was a prophet. He was a convert to Judaism. So a lot of converts took the name of Vajah because the prophet of Vajah, one of the books of the Bible, was himself a convert to Judaism. And he was a convert from the nation of Edom, which was Rome. So there was another convert from the time of Maimonides who was named, his, he was named Giovanni or Johan. He was a monk. He was a monk living in Italy, and he converted to Judaism during the First Crusades. Now, I just want to give you an idea what it means to convert to Judaism during the First Crusades, if you're a monk in Italy. You have to understand, if you are a Christian, convert to Judaism in Europe, up until the 19th century, that was a capital crime. They would kill you. They'd burn you at the stake alive. 
If you converted to a Christian version of Judaism. If you're a monk that converted to Judaism, they would torture you beforehand. And if it was during the first crusades, there wouldn't even be a trial. So here he converts to Judaism. Why did he convert? There are a few reasons. A, he was a thinker. Right? B, he saw the brutality of the crusaders, supposedly religious Christians, and what they were doing to the Jews. He also witnessed the incredible devotion and, uh, of the Jews who refused to give up their Judaism and would prefer to face horrific deaths and torture rather than do that. So he was inspired. He also, there was a bishop in that area, the Bishop of Barry, right, who also converted to Judaism, but he was executed. Anyway, Giovanni, who changed his name to Avadja, was able to escape from Italy and made his way to Aleppo in Syria. There was a large Jewish community in Aleppo. From Aleppo, he went to Cairo, and he was living in Cairo. And he composed a beautiful song, which I have the song here. Now, what's, what's, uh, now, okay, we've got a lot of poems and songs composed by many different people. What's special about this one is the following. First of all, it's a song about uh, Moses, Mial Har Chorev, right, who stands on Mount Chorev. But more than that, what, what is amazing is that in the Cairo Gniza was found the song with, what are those? Music. The musical notes. The musical notes. So actually, this is the oldest Jewish sheet music ever discovered. Dates back over 800 years, written by a convert to Judaism in Cairo before the time of Maimonides. Right? And what's very, very beautiful about it is that a, a group of researchers in Israel were able to actually play it with original instruments. And I've got a little clip of it here, so if you'll bear with me. kids in Israel, and he said he was, uh, he, he was in the army at the time, he was playing it right, on, his, uh, on his Blackberry for the guys. He said people just kept asking, can you play this again and again? They just listened to it like six, seven times over. He said, just like, everyone felt this is like, wow, it goes like, as one of them said, my mum is a nichnas on the shama. You know, it goes into the soul. Anyway, that's from Ovadia, the uh, convert. This is a letter from, you may have heard of Yehuda Halevi, <laughs> Judah Halevi, very prolific Jewish writer, poet. Uh, author. This is a letter Rebuda Halevi wrote. He let the six letters uh, Rebuda Halevi wrote to a friend of his called Chalfon, who was a great scholar and was also a uh, very well, very wealthy businessman and merchant. One of the letters, very interesting. I just got a translation here. He has a book, the famous book, the Kuzari, which is one of the great books of Jewish philosophy. Right? He actually writes. He says he wrote. He sent this book to a friend of his, a doctor called Yosef Ibn Barzel. 
And he said, he sent it to him, and Yosef ibn Mazel praised it. Now, what's it? here's what he writes. The book about the Khazars, among the favours that the physician and rabbi, Master Joseph ibn Barzel, has done for me, was to praise this bit of foolishness that I wrote. Otherwise, I would hesitate to show it to you. Basically, the gist of the letter is this. You know what he felt? He felt this was not a great book. He was a little embarrassed by it. It wasn't one of his best products, he felt. He sent it to his friend, the doctor, who said, this is awesome! So because his doctor friend said it was good, he decided to send it to his friend Khalfon, and Khalfon eventually took commission to publish it. So thank God we have got the unbelievable book, the Kuzari, only because Yehuda Levi's friend, Yosef, the doctor, right, praised the book, and therefore we have it. But otherwise, Yehuda Levi would have said, eh, it's not so good, he wouldn't have published it. So anyway, that's a, that's a little bit of background. And also, from this letter we see, he wrote the book to answer the questions of a Jew who converted to Christianity somewhere in Europe. And that's the address on the back of the letter, which basically just has the name of the person and the town that he lives. How they actually got there, I have no idea. Right? Just the name and the place where he lives. Whatever. I have a close friend in Dallas, Texas, by the name of Rabbi Yerachmiel Fried. He is a student of a very great rabbi in Israel who passed on, whose name is Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach. Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach is a very great rabbi in Jerusalem who sent a letter, it was actually about a few weeks before he passed away, to my friend Rabbi Rabbi Freed in Dallas. Right, he showed me the envelope. The envelope has on it Rabbi Freed Dallas. Yeah. He got the letter. Uh. So I guess he was just following you at our ladies. Uh. Not many Rabbi Freed. <laughs> it could be there's not that many. Anyway, this is very cool. This is you walk into a store and you want to know if it's kosher. What do you look for? Kosher. You look for a kosher certification. This is a kosher, kosher certification from Cairo in the 12th century. Right. It actually is signed by three rabbis. It's a, a cheese store. There were some Karaites who ran a cheese shop. But now Karaites don't keep the law in the same way as we do. So these rabbis had the Karaites take an oath on a chumash, it says here. Right? Shvua batorah dosha. They took an oath in the holy Torah and they shook on it because the Karaites shaking hands was a big deal. So they shook on it that they wouldn't change from the supervision of the rabbis. And so you walked into a store in Cairo you, and you'd say to the guy, is your cheese kosher? He'd say, sure, here, here. And he'd show you a hefsher. I mean, it's a, what's, what's a very touching to me is when I feel, is when I see how, how similar we are to the Jews of Cairo 800 years ago. They had prenuptial agreements. They had tuvot. They had kashrut certifications. Right? They, had, right? they had litigation in courts. They had... They had the tuvah, the same tuvah that we do, right? It was amazing. They had pens that ran out of ink, right? <laughs> you know, we, if, we were, if, if we were walked back into Cairo, right, you, you couldn't speak Arabic, but if you could speak Hebrew, you'd be able to get along with them. You'd be able to figure things out, right? You'd be able to know if I'm if mincha, they'd know what mincha is. Tfilin, mezuzah, they know all these terms, right? They would have no idea what pizza is. They'd have no idea what American Idol is, right? They'd have no idea, right? But... But all the important things in life, we would know and they would know, we'd be able to get on just like that. That's, that's one of the most mind-blowing aspects of this, right? This is a Kaddish, a very old version, one of the oldest versions of Kaddish that is known. It is actually from Israel, and you'll see a few things here. In the Kaddish, one of the things that, that the Jews would do in ancient times in Kaddish, today when we say Kaddish, we say, B'chayechon which means, in our lives... And in the lives of, and the days of all the Jewish people, may, may God bring the Redeemer, etc. However, in ancient times, they'd say in our lives and in the lives of rabbi, and they'd add the names of the rabbis. Like the local rabbis, as honor to the rabbis, they'd say in our lives and in the lives of Rabbi Sarabowski and Rabbi Miller, may the Redeemer come to that. That's what they do. So, for instance, here you see, I don't know if you can see that, right? In the life of our master, Eviatar the priest, right? Rosh Yeshiva, the head of the Yeshiva, Gaon Yaakov, right? Bechaye Rabbeinu Shlomo Hakohen, in the life of Rabbi Shlomo Hakohen, etc., etc., etc. And then they go on, Bechaye Rabbeinu Shlomo Hakohen, Bechaye Rabbeinu Shlomo Hakohen, etc., etc. That's an old version of the Kaddish. This is the oldest Haggadah in the world. Um, this actually is 11th century, and it's a section that obviously this page is missing. But you can see, you see that, that's the end of Kiddush. Mekadesh Yisrael ve Hazmanim. 
The one difference here is they'd say a blessing, which we don't say in our Haggadah. Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed are you our God, King of the Universe. Sha'asan Yisim Avoteinu, you did miracles for our fathers, Biyamim Ha'elu, in those days. When do we say that blessing? Purim. Purim and? Hanukkah. Hanukkah. We don't say that at any other festival. But evidently, in, this, in 12th century Cairo, there were people who said that blessing in the Haggadah. Also, and this messes things up, how many questions are there? How many questions are there? Haggadah, how many questions do you have? Four. Uh uh-uh. uh. They have five questions. They have five questions. They add one more question. Here's the question they add. Right? But Shabachol Halilot, on all other nights, Anuachlim, Basar, Bein Basar, Sli, Shalukum of Vashar. We eat meat which is boiled, cooked, and baked. Right? Halayla Hazet, tonight, Hayinu Ochlim, we used to eat in the temple, Babet Hamidash, right? Kulot Sli, only roasted meat. Because on that night, in the times of the temple, what meat did we eat? The meat of the Passover offering, which was roasted. It was roasted on a spit, right? So they added, so all those, all those Divrei Torah that people with the pattern of four, etc., all get messed up here. Because they had five questions, not four, right? This, again, this is another, one of the other most touching things. Anyone see what these are? These are 11th to 12th century workbooks of children in Cairo practicing to write Aleph Bay. So there are kids from Cairo practicing the Aleph Bay. See that? And here's one kid. There's a doodles. <laughs> I saw that. I, I asked him, what is it? He says, it's a doodle. The kids have not changed. They're learning Aleph Bay and they're doodling. What does he doodle? That to me it looks like a camel. With, with a smiling face. Uh, either it's Magendavin. I thought there was actually stirrups, but I'm not sure. It could be, it could be. And here is a... That's a menorah. So basically the kid has... What is that? Aleph, he's a lousy writer. Right? This is a kid who had lousy writing and who doodled a lot. Right? So I don't know what happened. You know, but basically he's probably good at sports. Right? Anyway, here's another kid. Here was the nerdy kid. He got beaten up at recess. Right? Look at this. This is nice. There's a kid who's practicing Aleph Bay with the same nukudot, the vowels that we use, the same light. Right? right? And here's another one. Here's another kid who did a doodle. Right? First of all, what are these letters? Mem nun sari peichaf. Those are the letters that change when they get to the end of a word. Right? Menasa. Right? That's right. And here, he's doodled a... Anyone know what that is? That is actually... I, I, I researched this a little bit. In, in the 11th century, Nile boats looked like that. They were, they were flat, flat bottom boats with things on each side and type of like house-like structures on the ship. Right? And there he is, Mr. Sun. I guess that's how they used to do a sun back there. So anyway, that's really cool. Like, you know, I see that. My kids learn Aleph Bay. You know, the same. I'm sure my kids, I showed it to my kids. They said, oh, yeah, my kids used to doodle all the time. I mean, it was a big thing in our family. Everyone doodles. You look at our kids' workbooks, doodles everywhere. But I said, it's not terrible. There are Rishonim who doodle. Right? But here, these, part, these guys doodle back in Cairo. So the Rambam, Pam ran out of me. His kids doodled. Right? People didn't pay attention in class. Just like nothing is... They had, they had customer certification on their cheese, etc., etc. It's an amazing and beautiful thing to see. This is a letter from someone I'm sure you've heard of, Rabbi Yosef Karo, author of the Code of Jewish Law. He lived in Cairo for a short time before he moved to Tzvart. And in Cairo, he was a businessman. He engaged in business before he wrote the Code of Jewish Law. And he wrote... This is actually a business letter. But look... Actually, sorry, whoops. Beauti- it's actually beautiful uh, calligraphy. I mean, it's beautiful handwriting. Right? I mean, the Rambams was terrible. He's a doctor, understandable. But I mean, this is nice. <laughs> this, is a, this is the signature of Yosef Karo, author of the Code of Jewish Law. There's Yosef Karo. Here's a letter. This is the complete letter. Obviously, he was a man of some importance in business because the, the Amir Ash- Dr. Ashur told me the fact that you can use waste so much paper when paper was very, very expensive is a sign of your importance and the fact that this was an important letter. Mm-hmm. So he showed, that's the, I just want to show you the whole size of it to show you the importance. This is a letter from another person who was a businessman in Cairo for a short time, and his name was Rabbi Isaac Luria. He was the greatest Kabbalist that ever lived. Rabbi Isaac Luria, who uh, was, his parents passed away in Israel. He moved to Cairo, he was, where he was taken care of by his uncle. His uncle was a very wealthy Jew in Cairo who actually owned an island on the Nile. And the Arizal used to go to the island and meditate on the Zohar, Jewish mystical writings. And that's where the Zohar basically began to reveal itself to him and he developed his whole system. He went to Tzfat, 
By the time he got to Tzfat, he'd already fully developed the system, and he was there for a little less than three years. What he taught in a little less than three years in Tzfat revolutionized the study of Kabbalah and took his maid student, Rav Chaim Vital, approximately 45 to 50 years to record it all in writing. To see our result. So this is a business letter of Rav Isaac Luria, uh, and uh, you can see there his, his, there's the date at the end of the letter, and here is a close-up of his signature, Yitzchak Luria, Isaac Luria. So that's a little bit of some of the... Con now, I should point out, what else is there in there? Where is it all found? In Cambridge, which I've just shown you here, Cambridge University, where's Cambridge? Cambridge has got 198,000 manuscripts. However, in the New York Jewish Theological Seminary, there are 30,000 manuscripts. John Ryland's University, 11,000. And all over the world, there are scattered all over the place fragments of the Cairo Geniza. People who, tourists who went there, scholars went there, collectors went there. People have been picking up pieces from it literally for a thousand years. So really, it's all over the world. So this guy, Dov Friedberg, has done an amazing thing. What he's done is financed a project to digitalize all the uh, fragments and put them on the internet. So, so some universities have agreed, not all of them. Cambridge has agreed, and they're in the process of doing that. John Ryland's university's collection, which is 11,000, is all on the internet already. Oxford hasn't agreed yet. Could be because they, they lost that debate because of the right. I think they're probably still they've still got a grudge right about Solomon Schechter defeating their man. Anyway, but it's all over the world. What's still to remain? What's still there uh, in the Knizza? There are a few things that haven't yet been published. They found there. 50 unpublished responsa by Avraham, son of Maimonides' son. Avraham was a scholar in his own right. And there are 50 unpublished responses of him to people. And this really is amazing. There are notes taken by students of Maimonides of his Talmud classes. So someone was, Maimonides gave Talmud classes in Cairo. Students would sit there and take notes in Arabic, obviously. The class was in Arabic. We have actually notes that students took of Maimonides' Talmud class. And also of the Ri Migash, Rabbi Yosef Ibn Migash, who was the rabbi of the rabbi of Maimonides' father. So the rabbi, yeah, the rabbi of the rabbi of Maimonides' father. We have his Talmud class notes as well. So there's probably a lot more treasures still to be found in the Giza, right, and still waiting to be seen. Right? Again, you can access a lot of these things if you Google Taylor Schechter, Giza Research Unit, or you just Google the Cairo Gniza, you'll be able to find on the internet a lot of these manuscripts and see them for yourself. It's a fascinating, fascinating thing to see, right? The, the Cambridge University puts one, you don't have to register or pay, you can see what's called the Gniza Fragment of the Month. Now, the fragment, you can look at the fragment, and it gives you a little explanation of it. Anyway, to me, this is an amazing thing, is bridge the generation gap. Right? I feel that easily, if my minorities would walk into here, we'd have what to talk about. If we were to walk to Cairo, we'd have what to talk about. And we could also eat the cheese. And our kids would feel comfortable doodling with the other kids in class. Thank you very much. That's it for this evening. <laughs>